In conjunction with Tom Oman of the Twice Weekly Sailing Podcast, Sailing Illustrated, this is our first, exclusive preview of the 37th America's Cup to be held later this year in Barcelona, Spain. The racing is between America's Cup, 75-foot yachts, and they are assembling now in Spain, in readiness for testing and competition. Tom, over the years, has led many America's Cup syndicates who have won the Cup, and others who have challenged. He is regarded as the Cup expert. We commence our report with the Swiss challenges. Olingi Red Bull Racing. I've now <gasps> coined oh. four-letter uh, abbreviations for these teams going forward. Oh, that's the Swiss flag. That's their beautiful team base. They had a great base in Valencia, and yeah. it looks like they have an equally cool base. They always have good bases. In España. Well, Ernesto's not poor. And they have and, great food. <laughs> and, yeah, they, that's a great team. They're going to be good. They're going to be good. Mark my words. I, I'm on that side. I told you that early on. So you use that finger again. <laughs> Joe Holtzman thinks we should use the 1812 overture for that Grant Dalton. <laughs> 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 so ARBR has been there. And indeed, let's go to their photo because they were the first to arrive in Barcelona. And they're having their reveal party as we speak. And there is the image. Oh, a link that uh, Fabian Haraldson sent us, and thank you for that link. And what is going on there? Jody was saying, "Holy, holy hell, Batman! Uh, uh, that is that looks like uh, some kind of a Cirque du Soleil act." Mm -hmm. And only Red Bull would come up with something. Red Bull's a fabulous sponsor for the promotion, the cross promotions mm -hmm. that they do. And look at that! Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's the sale. <laughs> it is the sale. Now, those of you who are more technically oriented will be looking at the hull, as I've been studying that hull myself here while the videos, the other videos are running. I'm going to try to zoom in a bit. Look at that. Those people suspended from some kind of a crane-held lighting system. Man, oh, man. Well, you got to hand it to Red Bull and Alinghi, but look at this. Mm-hmm. That is a huge skeg. That is a huge bustle mm -hmm. and a big bow forward. There's a lot of volume forward in that boat. They must be anticipating the big seaway off Barcelona. And look at the big, what looks like a big broad transom. Look at that. Wow. And that bustle, that skeg, mm -hmm. there's this bustle in that hedgerow. Goes all the way back, I guess, or is that blocked off? There's some disguising on there. You can see the that may be disguised way there in the back. See that? Oh, wait, is my cursor? Yeah, my cursor is barely showing on the screen. It's a cool photo. Yes, I think my cursor is back here, isn't it or not? Then there looks like they've covered up their foils and the knuckles on their foil arms. Because remember, once they splash with a set of foils, if memory serves, that's the foils they have to use. So they, I think it boxed around the knuckles. So they've revealed the yacht, but they haven't revealed some of the detail on their foil arms. No, the foil arms are not by any means one design, right, Steve? Mm -mm. Steve Goober's asking, trying to use the skeg trap to trap the airflow for lift effect, Ed Worley is saying. That is some That's interesting. interesting looking beast. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm all for him. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting. I wonder where if they were to win. It's a little early. The all new box foil. Steve Atkins has, has coined a new phrase, the box foil. Hmm. Okay. Any other comments? Singray says, I'm guessing they have moved some foil weight up into the foil arm elbows to allow for better control systems in size and hydro on the foil bulbs and wings. That's interesting. The crew space is compressed. Steve Groover, that may be a good observation as well. It's hard to see when you can't look down on the deck. Mm -hmm. But in any event, there is the reveal. And thanks, Fabian Harrelson, for that link. And others. there are other links in the comments, so please... Uh, if you're watching in replay especially, but those of you who are even watching live will want to go back and push on the some of the buttons there that have uh, some of the links, though, that uh, have been afforded 
to mm -hmm. all of us by our FOSI, our superb community. Community, I like that word, Julia. You yes, like indeed. that word? I do. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, Ed Worley, when I look at AC 75s, I see dollars in dollars. Let's go look at that one more time because, you know, as exciting as that is, mm -hmm. and I do find it exciting mm -hmm. and interesting, the problem still is that the foiling is just not that interesting. Hence, the America's Cup is just not in that interesting to mainstream yacht racing because people don't relate to it because they, when they go yacht racing, 90-some-odd percent of our people, when we go sailing, don't go sailing on boats that have foil arms and foils and huge skegs and, and, and. Okay. Yeah, Gordon Smith, I wouldn't, I agree with you. I wouldn't get too carried away about the last two to three meters of that boat because it looks, it does look like there's some blockage back there, some signage and might be some, still some. Although I don't know what the rules are about, uh, about outdoor. You know, we did have a rule that says when the boats were outdoors, once you did reveal them, but maybe there's a certain date after when you cannot uh, hide, hide the underbodies of your we shall see. Yeah, Hamish says yeah, he's he's saying not just ninety percent, ninety nine percent of the people who go yacht racing are never going to relate to these boats because mm. they're not really relatable. No one's ever going to sail. Very few people are ever going to sail on boats like this, let alone boats with cyclors. We got a cyclor video today. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're an hour into this one, and this is cool stuff. But it's again, it's. It's not only unobtaining, but it's unrelated. Un uh, we got to come up with another. Uh, unrelated. Unrelated. Re unrelated. -ium. Unrelated. -ium. <laughs> unrelated. -ium. Yeah. Now, we told you about American Magic flying, being flown on the Antonov, and Sail World has done a follow up on that for us uh, a couple days ago, a few days ago. America's Cup, the Antonov Airlines deliver the American Magic's AC 75 to BCN. We had the photo of them loading the boat at Providence Airport, and a video of the plane of courtesy. Actually, I've now texted back and forth. He's not really a fozy, but it's a guy that is in Providence who is a bit of a yachty, and thanks to him for letting, well, for doing the video. It was a Facebook video I found. The largest transport aircraft, Antonov Airlines AN-124, remember the big one, the 225 was destroyed in the war. It was chartered with the logistics partners GAC Pindar, G A C Pindar, that's Andrew Pindar, mm -hmm. our FOSI, right, right? And Solent Freight Services to deliver the AC 75 racing yacht, excuse me, 22 meters long, five meters wide, and three and a half meters high. This is an article carried by Sail World with the, uh, the press release from American Magic. So we know that that was done. The question is, how are the Kiwis going to get their boat, which is still in Auckland? How are they going to get it? Because if they ship it, they can't go through the Red Sea because the Hooties can't go. I mean, they're not going to risk sending their boat. No, Nobody wants to go through the yeah. Suez Canal, through the Red Sea. So are they going to fly their boat or are they going to ship the boat? Stingray's got some news on that for us here at the end of this segment. In the meantime, American Magic is there. They're working on the boat in the shed. And they put out a video just uh, earlier today about their design team, including Britt Ward, who we said was on here watching early on. Mm -hmm. uh, Scotty Ferguson, who's the head of the, uh, the whole technical program. And uh, a couple other cool people enjoy this video. Boat 3 was really conceived by the American Magic design team, led by Britt Ward and Pete Melvin as the principal hall designers. You know, it has over 70,000 man hours, you know, at the hands of Brandon and the build team in, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. I mean, it's unbelievable to see what has been created really at the hands of the American Magic team. It's pretty impressive. Here today, we are uh, preparing to roll our new boat out the door. Uh, it's just freshly shrink wrapped and gonna head to the Airport, we're able to meet an Antonov and fly straight to Barcelona. The America's Cup is a race about time. So we've chartered an Antonov 124, big Ukrainian cargo planes to bring it here. The transport doesn't need an engineer like me on board, but I was gonna to come to Barcelona at the same time anyway, so I decided to go with it. It was quite a journey, yeah, quite an experience. 
No, it looks unreal. It's um, they've done a great job, designers and, and the boat builders, painters. It's yeah, it's it's impressive. As as Doug puts it, it's a piece of art. To actually get the boat into the shed in Barcelona 41 hours after it left the build facility with so many things that could go wrong. Um, it's an amazing moment for the team. We look forward to getting it out on the water. When you look at the trajectory of the boat and how it got here and the execution of that, only build confidence in the team. As you plan one of these programs and one of these campaigns, you have milestones inside of it. Here you have the meeting of a deadline that takes 70,000 man hours. And so to see the enthusiasm that has come over our team with the arrival of really what's the future for us on the water is really exciting. These guys in Rhode Island, they've, they've been working hard. You can tell it's a nice piece. It's looking really good. She's gonna be fast. It's good to see her finally here and ready to start ripping it up. It's 1.27 in the morning and everything after this you're not allowed to see. It feels like Christmas came a little bit late, um, but it feels awesome. Like to have the boat now back in the tent and uh, and getting prepped ready for sailing. It's a, such an exciting part of the campaign where you, you're there looking at it, wondering what it's going to be like to sail. You've seen all the simulations, you've seen the drawings on the computer, but to see it in real life is uh, it's a special moment. Boat is uh, the next uh, winning America's Cup boat. We remove the, the foam as a new TV. <laughs> and <laughs> ready to go, <laughs> exactly what we ordered. Uh, now when the real battle starts. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's it's going to go so fast. It's going to be crazy. So what, are you, what are you feeling? Can't wait. Can't wait? Yeah. It's better than we expected. Actually, we you have high expectations the from the boat builders back there yeah, and they deliver, like, man. They make it look good. As far as quality, of construction, it's as good as it gets. Everything's come out right as we wanted it to, so yeah, really happy with what we have. There's some features of the boat that we're super proud of and, and super curious whether the other guys are doing similar. This is the most excited I think I've been about a campaign and a, and a race boat. I'm optimistic about where we're gonna stack up rel relative to the rest of the fleet. We definitely are all very impressed with, uh, with what's come out of the the design tools and, and what we have here is a, a physical boat. Uh, we hope it's going to be quick. From here, we spend basically five weeks fitting out uh, boat three. Early May, we'll have a celebration and a, and a cracking of the bottle by Commodore Harrington. You know, we got a long way to go, um, but the shore team will keep chipping along and, and get us into a spot that we can go sailing. Come on aboard. go to Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli because their boat has been built in Northern Italy. Of course, you have to build a boat in the country uh, mm -hmm. of your challenging club. And LRPP's boat was built at Persico Marina up uh, near Milan, Milano. And in late March, it arrived down at their team base in Cagliari, down in the southeastern corner of Sardinia. And that is a photo of it being uh, it was shipped down there, I guess from Genoa. I'm not sure where. Stingray and I were talking this morning trying to figure out if it went from Livorno or from Genoa or where. It doesn't matter. It's down there now in Colliery, and they're fitting the boat out. As you heard Terry T. Hutch say, they're fitting their boat out, the New York Yacht Club boat out in, actually they're in Barcelona. They're going to fit their boat out, that is LRPP, in Colliery in Sardinia. And then when it's done, they're going to splash it in fact, they're going to splash it here on the 13th, or at least reveal it. And I don't know if they're actually probably will splash it as well. Probably load test it and sail it in due course, then pack it back up and get up to Barcelona. Here is their video. We played this commercial Tuesday, but I'll play it again. It's very brief. Promoing their big live television coverage of their event, their commissioning event on the 13th of this month. Okay, so that's coming up, and we'll watch that, no doubt, live. Mm -hmm. 
on the 13th. Now, this is a video that also came out today. This from Lunarosa Prada Pirelli, and it's, it's kind of the double-edged sword about these cyclores. And again, it makes our sport, to, it makes the America's Cup unrelatable to so many people who are normal yacht racing, you know, as Hamer said, 99% of the people who go yacht racing, but it also makes it interesting, except that, as we've said on here before, so many people think that the cyclers are turning some kind of a propeller onto the <laughs> boat to either help it get up out of the water or God knows what. Yeah. This is a, uh, a long, not long, it's not that long, but three minutes and change video, but uh, in, and it's in Italian, but there are... A, English subtitles, so it's a cool video about the cyclor, uh, featuring one of the cyclors on the Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli team. Il problema della il il peso è fondamentale su queste barche, su tutte le barche. Purtroppo la mia fisicità mi porta a essere 100 più di 100 kg e quindi certi ruoli sono mai perclusi. che la l'unica chance, possibilità di navigare su queste barche è riprendere un ruolo di site. Cercare di pedalare due o tre ore tutti i giorni, più allenarsi coi pesi e in più magari stare in mare, a terra a lavorare, mi occupa tutta la giornata e anche di più. È un inseguimento di un sogno e quindi è accettabile. Sono Enrico Voltolini, nel team Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli ricopro il ruolo di cyclor, eh, di boat captain della C40 su cui siamo in questo momento e sviluppo la parte di potenza a bordo per il 75. Beh, io ho sempre avuto una, una passione smisurata per le barche, qualsiasi tipo di barca, sin da bambino. Sportivamente sono cresciuto nel, nel mondo del nuoto, fino a 19 anni quando mi sono trasferito alla Spezia per studiare ingegneria nautica. Poi mi ha preso sotto la sua ala protettrice, diciamo, eh, Valentin Mankin, che è stato un grande per la vela italiana e mi ha insegnato veramente tantissimo. Devo a lui veramente tanto di quello che so. Dove vogliamo stare, Marco? Io devo fare in modo che la barca sia eh, il più pronta possibile perché ovviamente più ore mettiamo in acqua e più il team cresce, si sviluppa la capacità di manovrare, eh, playbook e quant'altro. E devo mettere insieme i vari dipartimenti, coordinarli tra di loro in maniera che appunto la barca sia sempre pronta. D'altro canto eh, devo spendere del tempo a, per allenarmi e, e questa è un'altra fonte di se vuoi, preoccupazione e stress perché comunque i ragazzi eh, che saranno a bordo con me o comunque che saranno a bordo del 75 sono dei canottieri olimpici, quindi il massimo dell'atleticità. Quindi è un continuo push. Eh, io peraltro sono uno una sorta di individualista, faccio tutto da solo, però mi rendo conto che eh, qui non si arriva se non c'è il team, cioè non sei nessuno da solo, sei qualcuno all'interno di un team, sei una casella del puzzle e il team ha una potenza di fuoco che è molte più volte moltiplicata rispetto al numero dei team member, è impossibile pensare di essere soli. Sono individualista, però eh, sono uno che per il team dà di più che per se stesso. Now, what did you think of that video? It was okay. Yeah. Did you, did you read the subtitles? Yes. I was looking to try to get this thing from Fabian... Haroldson up, he sent another video of the Olingi, uh, of the, yeah, of the Olingi boat, and I, I didn't get to it, but it, it's, a, it's, the production values of that video are superb. I mean, Mr. Oh, Fratelli is spending real money on promotion, as he does, because he needs to be promoting at the level of Prada, at a high level. Yes, and he does. And he does, indeed.
Okay, now the next thing is to update you on the French team because you may have seen on my Facebook page, they have shipped their boat by truck from France down to Barcelona. We not, we're not 100% sure if it's there yet. I understand it's to arrive this weekend. You know, it's a very slow, tricky thing to ship a boat that wide or anything that wide by truck. You have to do it at night, more or less. And you got to have escort vehicles and so on. It uh, started out in Van. Is that how you say that city, Julie? V A N N E, which mm-hmm. is up near Quiberon. We know Quiberon from sailing. Mm-hmm. That's the Multiplas shipyard and the builder of Orient Express. Now, Multiplas is one of the best boat builders shipyards in the world. They build all a lot of the French catamarans. They they built um, uh, Boris Hermann's. Uh, Boats, you know, we've been following Boris yeah. for Monaco, yes. for Germany, and so on, in Vendée Globe, etc. So they built the AC-75, and then they shipped it by truck, or they're in the process of shipping it. Look at this. Talk about a wide load. Ooh. C'est le départ du bateau, là, après euh, un peu plus de 7 mois de construction chez Multiplast. Ça, on a réussi à, à tenir le, le délai qu'on s'était fixé il y, a, il y a un an maintenant. On devait au moins être une soixantaine de personnes sur, sur le projet. C'est ça qui a permis de, de tenir les délais euh, et de, de construire un bateau dans un temps euh, très très court par rapport à ce qu'on, ce qu'on fait habituellement. Comme c'est un gabarit quand même assez imposant, on a le bateau qui est sur un camion qui est accompagné de deux voitures, de deux motards pour euh, voilà, sécuriser la route. Au bout de quatre jours de trajet, il est arrivé ici à, à Barcelone. Un long périple et surtout très stressant parce qu'on n'avait pas envie que, qu'il lui arrive quoi que ce soit sur la route. Et Léo Chapalin a, a bien rempli cette mission. Il y a un an, on n'avait même pas reçu les formes de, du bateau. Et là, un an après, on a un bateau euh, coque-pont, structuré, prêt à être équipé. Euh, c'est un peu de frisson quand on se dit qu'on y est, la coupe c'est maintenant, ça se joue quoi. Et que les deux prochains mois ils vont être intenses jusqu'à la mise à l'eau et, et après on n'a plus qu'à s'entraîner et être meilleur. C'est Meanwhile, Yes. There you go, Julie. You see Ineos Britannia, mm-hmm. the challenger of record. And if we do a four-letter code, I guess it would be IBCR or COR, but uh, Ineos Britannica, Britannia, not Britannica, that's the encyclopedia, Britannia, is also en route by truck to Barcelona from their build site up in in England. Now, how, how did they get, or maybe they got the, by truck from their build site up by Brackley, um, uh, it, was it the Carrington Yard, down to maybe Southampton, and then they're shipping it or barging it around to Barcelona. completed the last leg of a pretty big logistical movement. Uh, we started off in Hythe in Southampton, the Carrington boats, took the boat up to Brackley. We have a workshop there in Western Airfield. And then the last leg has been from the UK, a ferry down to uh, Santander and then into Barcelona. Sort of last couple of days I've been driving across the country of Spain and, and got it in the building this morning. So it's great to see it in the, in the shed. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's the next phase. So it's been a really big push to get the boat here. Everyone from the design, manufacturing, logistics, you know, to get the boat down here. And now we're in, it's, it's a different switch that we throw to, to think about getting the boat on the water and starting to operate it safely and really maximize the opportunities we have to get the most performance out of the yacht. We'll definitely be on the water soon. So we don't know how that's all happening. But here is a summary, thanks to Stingray, of what has just taken place or is taking place. Olingi Red Bull Racing was built at the decision. That's the I don't know if, if Ernesto owns that yard. I think he's got a stake in that yard. They built several of their boats up there, America's Cup type boats. It was shipped by truck from Decision SA in Ecublens in Suiza, in Switzerland, down to Barcelona. And as you all know, it's there, and they've just revealed it tonight. 
So that's the status mm-hmm. of ARVR. Mm-hmm. And then New York American Magic, I think they were the second to arrive. I think they actually arrived about the same time, maybe a touch after Alingi did, but they are there as well. You've seen that nice video from T. Hutch, and we know mm-hmm. that our foesy Claire Harrington, Vice Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, is headed over there to smack the champagne bottle on the nose. I christen thee, we'll see what the name is. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, LRPP was built up there at uh, Persico in northern Italia, and whether they went to Genoa or to uh, Livorno to ship across the Tyrrhenian Sea down to Sardinia, we don't know for sure. Somebody on here may know. That boat is currently in Cagliari in Sardinia. You can see how I spent my morning, Julia, making mm-hmm. this bloody. <laughs> okay, now L'Oreal, Orient Express, was built up there. We just showed you Vaughn, V-A-N-N-E, there on the coast is where it was built at the Multiplast Yard. And it has been shipped down to Barcelona. We don't think it's there yet, but it's supposed to arrive this weekend. And then finally, the Brit boat, Ineos Britannia, Mm -hmm. was built at the Carrington. This is from Stingray. I think it was built at Carrington. Yeah, I believe it was. Then sent to Tur Weston Airfield near Brackley for extra fitting out and testing, load testing, then put yesterday, he thinks, on a cargo ship or barge in Southampton, aimed for Barcelona. So if any of you Brits know better, maybe if Andrew Pindar's on here, he may know. Of course, he's if you're probably under an NDA and can't tell us if Mm-mm. he does know. So that, as far as we know, is the status of the boats as they head to or are already in Barcelona, you'll say, what about the Kiwis? Get to that in a moment. But thanks, Stingray, our super fozy up in Seattle, for helping me put all of that together this morning. The Orient Express boat looked like it was leaning to port. What kind of design did they get? Yeah, well, I don't think it was leaning to port. I think, you know, they have to put it sometimes on the, to get it around. Mm-hmm. They ship things on their side like C'est le départ du bateau là, après euh, un peu plus de 7 mois de construction chez Multiplace. Ça, on a réussi à, à tenir le, le délai qu'on s'était fixé il y, a, il y a un an maintenant. On devait au moins être une soixantaine de personnes sur, sur le projet. C'est ça qui a permis de, de tenir les délais euh, et de, de construire un bateau dans un temps euh, très très court par rapport à ce qu'on, ce qu'on fait habituellement. Comme c'est un gabarit quand même assez imposant, on a le bateau qui est sur un camion qui est accompagné de deux voitures, de deux motards pour euh, voilà, sécuriser la route. Au bout de quatre jours de trajet, il est arrivé ici à, à Barcelone. Un long périple et surtout très stressant parce qu'on n'avait pas envie que, qu'il lui arrive quoi que ce soit sur la route. Et Léo Chapalin a, a bien rempli cette mission. Il y a un an, on n'avait même pas reçu les formes de, du bateau. Et là, un an après, on a un bateau euh, coque-pont, structuré, prêt à être équipé. Euh, c'est un peu de frisson quand on se dit qu'on y est, la coupe c'est maintenant, ça se joue quoi. Et que les deux tranches au moins vont être intenses jusqu'à la mise à l'eau et, et après on n'a plus qu'à s'entraîner et bien. Ok, now look, ETNZ uh, are testing. They're two boating, uh, and they've got their, their their women's team and their youth team, I think, are training also down in Auckland in those w- whatever boats there, the, the smaller boats. Um, I guess they're AC-40s. But there was a longer video from the design teams of uh, four teams, and I've at, at the suggestion, again, of Stingray, I've taken an excerpt, and it's a bit of a longer, it's nine and a half minutes long, but it's a must-see. It's fascinating. It's an interview with Dan Bernasconi, who is the head of the ETNZ design team and presumably has also designed or helped help the, the uh, French do their boat. And 
this is a must see. Listen carefully because there's a lot of very interesting things that Dan says in this interview. Remember, we had Dan on as one of our very first mm -hmm. guests in this America's Cup cycle live from Auckland. Have a look at this interview. We're very much a, a team and even the design team is 35 people. Uh, we've got engineers of all disciplines, um, hydrodynamics, naval architects, aerodynamics, structural engineers, materials, computer, software development, hydraulics, electronics. So it's, it's a big team. Um, my job is to try and pull that team together and make sure everyone's working on the important issues. But uh, it's certainly not a, a boat designed by one person. It's an interesting story how the AC-75 came about. Um, I think everybody knows that uh, the challenge of record was Luna Rossa and so we had to form an agreement with them as to what the class would be. Uh, it started off with a conversation uh, between Grant Dalton and Mr. Batali from Luna Rossa and I think Mr. Batali was pretty passionate about monohulls and so the first thing I knew was when Grant Dalton came to me and said well we've agreed that it's going to be a monohull and in our design team and our sailing team when I went back to them I said all right it's going to be a monohull everyone was a bit like really it's going to be a monohull and I think you know there was so much excitement in Bermuda about the speed of the foiling caps the idea of going back to a a really slow boat with a huge lead keel was quite difficult. So, I mean, they say necessity breeds innovation. We, as a design team, were faced with a challenge. It's like, okay, it's got to be a monohull, but what can we do about that? How can we make a monohull super exciting, super fast? And we developed um, in our simulator lots of concepts um, from like a, a huge moth concept to um, the AC-75 as you see it now and then lots of things in between. And we modeled these, we got our sailors to try sailing them in the simulator and working with Luna Rossa, we gradually evolved to this concept of the, the foiling AC-75. It was a bold choice, we had no time to build a prototype before the class rule was written. So we had to commit to that class and commit to the whole rules and parameters without ever having tested a boat of that type, except in simulation. I started off my career working at McLaren, Formula One. I was there for six years. Uh, and I, it was a fantastic place to work, really uh, clever bunch of guys, big team. Um, but I. I actually enjoy America's Cup a lot more. I mean, I've always been more into boats, but aside from that, the teams are much smaller in America's Cup. So everybody knows what everybody's job is. You can, I don't think there's a single person in this team who can't look at the boat and say that they've contributed to that thing. Whereas in a Formula One team, they're so huge that it's really quite difficult to really you know, understand what your contribution is. Um, I think when you bring a Formula One team together with an America's Cup team, um, as has happened this campaign with um, Ineos and with uh, Alinghi Red Bull, um, for sure there are talents, there's a lot of talent in the Formula One teams, um, aerodynamics, structural composite design, um, hydraulics, electronics. So. A lot of those skills should be transferable, but on the other hand, I think there's a lot of real niche expertise in both sides, in America's Cup and in Formula One. And I think within America's Cup, we've got people that are really, really experienced at the particular type of aerodynamics and hydraulics that we use, and in Formula One, the same for them. So when you bring them together, um, you know, there may be some advantages, but it's also a a lot of culture that you've got to, to mesh. And I think trying to mesh those two cultures it can bring a lot of issues. Um, you know, you've got a lot of, everyone wants to do their job, doesn't want someone else coming in and taking their job. So you've got a lot of politics to resolve. Whether the benefits you get on the technical side outweigh that, I, I don't know, maybe we'll see. I think as a team, you know, we're working 
on our own. Um, we don't have any collaboration with Formula One and there's no area where we feel we're really lacking. Um, you know, the areas that Formula One has real expertise in that's relevant, say hydraulics, I think maybe there's some you know, little bits of hydraulics that, that Formula One has knowledge of and experience of that we don't, but we don't feel very exposed. Um, so we're, we're confident to go it alone. There was a, a lot of pioneering work done, um, I guess, in the sort of 1980s, 1990s, about development of velocity prediction programs, which simulate the state of the boat when it's going in a steady breeze, in a straight line, not accelerating, not decelerating, it's just in equilibrium. Everything's perfectly balanced. And that was pretty good for the IACC boats because 99% of the time they were going in a straight line at a pretty steady speed. They maneuvered but they got up to speed pretty quickly. When we got into the foiling cats um, and then into the AC75, everything is about acceleration, about maneuvers, those are the important parts. So having a simulation tool which only looks when everything's balanced is, is not going to teach you that much about the behaviour of the boats. So we started developing over 10 years ago dynamic simulation tools which are kind of like flight simulators for boats and we can model all of the parameters of the yacht, we, we model the physics of the yacht 50 times a second, um, that look at the forces that the hydrodynamics and the aerodynamics are producing and then turn that into accelerations and velocities. And that enables us to look at how if we make a change to the foil or if we make a change to the sail or a change to the hull, how is that going to affect performance? What are the trade-offs? There's certainly a lot of interest now in foiling well outside the America's Cup, in, in other sports classes, um, and a lot of power boats from, from big ferries to uh, you know, recreational small power craft um, that are looking at foils. And the, the big difference to the foils that were around in the 60s and the 70s is these are actively controlled. So if you didn't have a sensing, a sensor of the ride height, and if you didn't um, have the hydraulics to continually change the flap angles, the, the boats wouldn't be able to, to foil, they wouldn't be able to fly, they'd be completely unstable. Um, having this naturally unstable foil allows much more efficient hydrofoils than those that were seen 50 years ago. Um, so the, the boats are dramatically more efficient and as we're looking to use um, new power sources, you know, whether it's batteries or hydrogen, that efficiency really matters. So I really think you know, it is going to continue to grow and grow and grow, um, the, the number of foiling boats around. Um, and I, I think there is potential for cruising boats. I think maybe there'd be quite different concepts to the boats out there at the moment. Um, but I, I'd certainly like to own one. And maybe there'll be classes in the future where not only the foils are controlled by autopilot, um, you know, potentially you can control pretty much everything on the boat and you, you, that takes you towards autonomous boats and uh, you've probably seen the autonomous marks we've got here which are you know, racing marks that don't need anchors and that's something else which we've developed here in Team New Zealand. Um, I think in the America's Cup we want to keep it as a sport so we, we want sailors to be involved and we want sailors to have the capability to make mistakes. The balance lies between creativity and engineering process and I, I very much believe that necessity is the mother of invention so I think you need to really understand the problem you're trying to solve incredibly well and understand that at a really fundamental level and then sort of throw away the preconceptions of solutions that have been seen before and then I think if you've got an open mind and you've got a clear vision of what you're trying to achieve, then the engineering process will bring those concepts to the fore. Uh, maybe that's what you call creativity, but um, I think it's still very much part of engineering. 
We've had some great questions through our social media channels about the progression of New York Yacht Club America and Magic through AC37. And when you reflect back to the fall of 2022, we launched Patriot after a refit. You're taking the learnings really from AC36 and applying them to our full-scale test bench. And so that Patriot session led into the delivery of our first AC40 and then again into the delivery of our second AC40. The first quarter and the second quarter of 2023 were fully focused on foil development in the two AC40s. Then you, you go into the second half of 2023 where we got into more racing focus. We were in Villanova, um, we were in the final sign-off of our foil development and then we ended up in Jetta. We went back into Patriot for final systems development, cycler development, and really using the final opportunity of our test bench, full-scale test bench, to sign off on areas that we wanted to develop. That that wrapped up in January of 24. Then you go straight back to two boat sailing. We get Magic back from Jetta and we set ourselves up to get into sail development in January, February of 24. And now we're back into two boat racing, but it all leads to boat three. It all leads to the time where we then will have roughly 10 weeks before we get close to racing boat three. Then we'll have another four weeks of informal racing with the other challengers. And then we get into the challenger selection series. But all of these milestones are always pointed and focused towards taking delivery of our race boat.